Okay, let's go ahead and get started tonight. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church. Wednesday night, Bible study and prayer time. Looking forward to a really good service. You got some, uh, remember you praying for the young people in the back. You got a couple a couple extra ones back in, the, in one of the classes, so that's always wonderful and good. But we're excited about what God's going to do out here tonight. And uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Ask the Lord's blessing on the service this evening. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for how good you are to us. We have so much to praise you for, so much to us be thankful for. And Lord, when we come on a Wednesday night, it reminds us how important it is to fellowship with one another. Many times we're around many, many people during out throughout the week that don't know you, that don't love you. And Lord, that just think contrary to the ways that the Bible teaches. It's nice to come and see a friendly face. Nice to come and be able to share a request with one another. Nice to come and be able to be an encouragement to one another. Lord, we look forward to opening up your word tonight as we look at a certain Bible character. And Lord, we pray that you help us. And Lord, I also lift up to you our prayer time too. Lord, we want to pray for the things you want us to pray for. Lord, we want what you want for our hearts and lives. Lord, we do pray for these young people in the back. Thankful for the ones that are there. Thankful for the new ones you brought, but also, Lord, we're asking that you would add to that. Lord, we want to make a difference in the next generation. Lord, we also lift up to you uh, those that are not feeling well. It's nice to have a few people back that have been not feeling good, but Lord, also there's some missing, and Lord, we pray you help them. Lord, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be able to be a part of Faith Baptist Church, and Lord, just an opportunity to be able to share your word tonight with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able to, we ask that you uh, stand with us as Brother Jim comes to lead us in our congregational singing. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. And after he's done all that in the history of this world can be done, we'll gather at the river. Let's sing that song, 330 in your hymnal. Shall we gather at the river? Sing all the verses, please. 330. Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Number 330. On the margin of the river, washing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll The beautiful river gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God last verse soon we'll reach the shining river soon our pilgrimage will cease soon our happy hearts will quiver with the melody of peace yes we'll gather at the river the beautiful the beautiful river gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of god you may be seated amen looking forward to that day be able to gather at the river that 
flows from the throne of God. And it's something to look forward to, that's for sure. We have things to do here, though. He has us here for a reason. He has us here for a purpose. And let's be faithful doing those things so we can even rejoice in a greater way when we get to gather with even more that we know because we've invited him and we've presented the gospel and encouraged others. Okay, announcement-wise, you have some different teen activities that are mentioned in there. Um, there is also a ladies' meeting October 24th at 630 and uh, also next Wednesday, I'm going to be out of town next week at a conference. Next week, Wednesday, Missionary Alan Berry is going to be preaching for us, filling the pulpit. So looking forward to that. So if you want to mark that down and uh, make sure you be praying for him for next Wednesday night as he's coming and preaching. All the other classes are still going to go in the back and uh, all those things are going to go on. I'm just going to be in Tennessee at a conference. So looking forward to that. So be praying for me and looking to get refreshed spiritually obviously that's why you go to the conference is to learn and to grow so i'm looking forward to that week but be praying for mr barry do your best to be here and be faithful that night too so but thank you for being here tonight okay our second song tonight is never alone while we are serving the lord jesus down here he's says he'll never leave us alone 183 we're seeing the first three verses i've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll i felt sin's breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul i've heard the voice of jesus telling me still to fight on he promised never to leave me never to leave me alone no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The world's fierce winds are blowing, temptations are sharp and seen. I feel a peace in knowing my Savior stands between. He stands to shield me from danger when earthly friends are gone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Verse 3. When in affliction's valley I'm treading the road of care, my Savior helps me to carry my cross when heavy to bear. My feet entangled with briars, ready to cast me down. He prom His promise never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me never to leave me alone no never alone no never alone he promised never to leave me never to leave me alone cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine true and tender pure and precious oh how blessed to call him mine love of Christ so freely given grace of God beyond decree Mercy higher than the heavens, deeper than the deepest 
My soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I sing. What a wonderful redemption. Never can a mortal know. My sin through red like crimson can be whiter than the snow. Every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see. On his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Okay, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight to the book of Judges, Judges chapter number 13. We are not beginning a new series, it's just a uh, message that the Lord kind of laid upon my heart and uh, looking forward to how, what God has in store for us the next couple months. We're beginning, um, once again, right now because of what we were doing on Sundays, we're not actually involved in any of the different, ser different series and we're going to pick up in the Gospel of Mark once again. But we're also going to be looking at possibly going back to the book of Proverbs on Wednesday night. And there's a couple other things I believe the Lord's leading us to be a part of. But tonight, when we're looking at Judges chapter number 13. We're going to look at a man full of potential. A man full of potential. Began thinking about all the different people in the Bible and all the different people that had great potential. And I think of the, one of the most, most uh, I don't know how you would say it, one of the most filled potential people or people with most potential in all the Bible or one of the most privileged men to ever live was the man um, Solomon. You think about it, he, he had a fa David for a father, but also had the kingdom kind of set up for him, had all those things already ready for him at the temple, also was able to ask of anything of the, the Lord, ask him what he wanted, he was wisdom. He had lots of different things, and we saw he's kind of squandered it away a lot. He, he didn't live up to his full potential. I could only imagine how great, how splendor the kingdom was if he would have been a man after God's own heart. You can only imagine what he would have done for the Lord because he was known for doing more than any king before him in a sense and also all the different things he was able to do physically and all those different advancements he was able to make because of that wisdom. And there, there's other different people that had such great potential and we saw how some of them have lived up to their potential, some lived past their potential, but many people because of sin do not live up to the potential that they have in the Lord. You think about what the Bible says about the word potential. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. It's not based off of what we can do, but it's the power that worketh in us. It's what the Holy Spirit can do through us. And you say, well, pastor, that's limitless. That's the potential that's there. It's limitless. So what we can do is we're surrendered to the Lord. We can be exactly what he wants us to be. Now, we don't always know what that is. We don't know what that looks like. But in the story here, we see the story of Samson. It was told that he was going to begin to deliver Israel. And in this story, I, and we're going we're gonna to go through and try to tackle the whole story of Samson in one week. Now, I'm sure down the road sometime we'll spend a month or four to six messages, maybe longer on it. And we've gone through the book of Judges years ago. But with this story here with Samson, the Lord just laid it upon my heart that there is potential there and potential there. And, and you know what? He doesn't, because of sin, that potential was never realized. Now, he, at the end of his life, he calls upon the Lord. And there's just a lot of different things. If you ever had the opportunity to teach a Bible lesson or preach a message, sometimes you get a certain topic, you know it's what the Lord wants you to do. You begin studying it and you think, wow, there's no way I can accomplish all this 
in one setting or one message. So it's a Wednesday night, so we're just going to assume that most people know who Samson was. We're going to most of are going to assume some different things that you know about the story, and we're just going to highlight some different things. And the reason why is because the potential is what we want to see. So the title of the message is A Man Full of Potential. Proverbs 4.13 tells us, I can do all things through Christ with strength in me. What does that mean? We're all people that are full of potential. Some people think, I can't do anything for the Lord. There's no way. Look at the way he made me. Look at the talents he gave me. Hey, the Lord did not make a mistake when he made you. Some people might tell you that you're a mistake. It's just not true. We are all full of potential and we are able to realize that potential as we surrender to the Lord. Ephesians 2.10 puts it this way, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and the good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now what he's saying there is that he has created us we're his workmanship and what are we created to do to do good works that's what he's desired for us to do that we should walk in them jeremiah 33 3 is one of those verses that you hold on to because it's one of those that you memorize call unto me and i will answer thee but that last phrase i can say in the last 10 years has really struck my heart more than it ever did before and that's when he says He's, and when he says in Jeremiah 33, 3, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For a long time, I couldn't get over the fact that God was listening and God was answering my prayers. But at the same time, he says, I will show you those things that you do not know. How many of us need to know some? I know. I need to know things. I'm, I'm sitting there and we got a crossroads that are in front of us and we don't know what the next step is. And he says, look, call unto me. I will answer thee. And then he's saying, I will show thee, the, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He's saying, I will reveal unto you those things that I had desired for you in your life. We just had to call unto him. We had to walk with the desire and say, God, I want to enter into everything you want for me. No part of me is held back. I want to reach that potential, what you desire for me. I want to make my desires your desires. And as I walk in those desires, I want, he says, I'll show you these great and mighty things which y'all know it's not. And I'm thankful for that. There's a promise we can hold on to. So here, here's tonight, we're going to look at a story about a man that was a man of promise. He was a man of power. He was also a man of pleasure. And he also was a man that was presumptuous. And so there, there's, a, and there's a man of pain there. So if you were taking notes, those are your five main points. Are we going to get through all five? We sure are. And we're going to, like I said, the only way we're going to do that is by doing a lot. So on Sunday, we had friend day. I thought friend day went really well. Um, we had lots of people. You know who, who made that happen? You guys and the Holy Spirit. And we're thankful for that. Thankful for everyone who brought visitors. Even had some that would raise their hand during the invitation time. They received, a, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And each of those uh, adults that had raised their hand spoke to somebody afterwards. And we were thankful for that. And because sometimes it's easy just to raise your hand during the middle of a service and not make any type of initiation to it that they actually spoke to an adult after. Now, none of them talked to me. That's okay. Would you really want to talk to me anyway? No, one, one, two of them talked to Brother Edwards. One spoke to my wife. And, uh, and so that, 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 once again, I was encouraged by that. And we will follow up with them as much as the Lord allows us to. We'll follow up with the visitors as much as they allow us to and the Lord allows us to. That's for sure. But there was potential there. And we, we see it and we wonder and we look around and we're thinking, well, why in the world do we not see that more often? As a church, why do not, why not see more people come on a more regular basis? He said, well, you don't have friend day, but once a year. Well, if we did friend day more often, you know what's going to happen. It's not going to become special. People aren't going to invite. But there's potential in our church. I mean, a great potential. Why is that? Because it's filled with people that are filled with potential. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to make it a numbers game to where we try to have the biggest church in Elizabeth City or the biggest church in the world. We want... We want what God wants, exactly whatever God wants. And it's full of potential because it's full of people that have the potential with the Lord. But just like in Samson's life, there were some things that stopped him from reaching his potential. And then what we want to do is we want to look in the word of God as a mirror and see if there's things that apply to us. And say, well, maybe I'm not reaching my potential individually. Or maybe as a church, we're not reaching our potential as a, as a group effort. Because there's some things in our life. Samson had some struggles. Because Samson had some struggles, he didn't, he, he didn't accomplish everything that God wanted him to do. But 
God still in his mercy and grace allowed him to do something great at the end of his life. So in God's mercy and God's grace, let's look in his word and say, God, you know what? Maybe I haven't lived up to my potential up to this point, but I'm thankful you still have a plan for me. You still have a purpose for me. You have a desire for me. And I want to live according to that potential. So let's, let's learn how to do that. The first thing I want you to see, he was a man of promise. Um, God often was here and he wanted to work through the nation of Israel. Look what it says in chapter 13, verse number one. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them out into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now you say, Pastor, you're talking about individuals. But as a church, you're talking collectively, yes. Could you imagine what the nation of Israel would have had? What they would have been able to experience? Having the whole promised land if they had lived by faith during the days of Joshua? Could you imagine the promises that were made to the nation of Israel over and over and over? They never, ever reached that potential. Why is that? Because they didn't serve God. And that's what he said here. They did what, they did what was wrong. He said, did evil and again in the sight of the Lord, and God delivers them up. He's merciful to them. He said, well, how is that merciful? He didn't leave them where they were at. When God allows certain things to happen in your life, it means that you're not, he's not going to let you continue to ruin your life. You know, they could have been wiped off the side of the world or the earth if they continue in their sin. God in his mercy took them to the Philistines to show them, hey, that you need to repent. You need to get things right. And sometimes you say, well, why would God allow churches to go through certain things or individuals to go through certain things? We need to wake up. There's some things there. There's some things you need to pay attention to. Let's, let's, whatever it is you're going through. And that's what happens with Samson. Samson has one of those dark days and you look at Samson and he, and he's, pull, he's pushing that, uh, that mill around and you're looking at this guy that had all this potential. You see his eyes are plucked out and he's, he's milling this, walking around in a circle, just like an animal's job would have been. And what, what you look at that and you say, well, what in the world happened? He had all the potential in the world. What happened there? And I think sometimes we look at other people and we say, whatever happened to them, they had all the potential in the world. And sometimes I think we've got to look in the mirror of the word of God and say, God's given me all his promises and God says he wants to work in my heart and life. What has happened that I'm so far from him? What's, what's happened that I'm not as close as I should be? What is going on that I cannot overcome the sin? You know, there's a long list of different things as the Holy Spirit reveals those into your heart. What is going on in my spiritual life that is not really what God wants? I'm not reaching the potential there in my walk with God, or I'm not reaching the potential that he desires for me. First thing I want you to see, he was a man of promise. It says in chapter 13, verse number 2, And there, there was a certain man, a Zorair, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, that thou shalt conceive, and bear a son." It continues on and he says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband. So we see here in verses 2 through 5, there is a promise that's made by the angel of the Lord. He comes and he says, look, guess what? You're going to have a child. You've been barren. You're going to have a child. And this child is supposed to be set apart, supposed to be a Nazarite before he's even born. He even tells the woman, don't partake in those things that is against the Nazarite vow also. And he continues on and he says here another promise. That's, he says at the end of verse number five, and he shall begin to deliver out of the hand of the Philistines. God is saying he's going to begin to deliver. I really think that if he had lived up to his potential and would have lived for God for all those years, he probably would have delivered him out of the hands. But God knew what he was going to do. But at the same time, God uses and begins to deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. So there's a couple of promises. Say, Pastor, what does it mean by that Nazarite um, vow? Now, let's take our Bible to Numbers chapter number six. In Numbers chapter number six, it talks about what the Nazarite vow looks like. Numbers is just a few books back. Numbers chapter number six. I know some of you know it, but I want you to see the illustration that's here in Numbers chapter six. And look what it says in verses one through eight. Number six, verses one through eight. 
The word of God said, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them. Now, once again, there's a main word that's emphasized over and over and over here. It says, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to a vow of a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. So we see the word separate already twice found in verse number two. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of the wine of the wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist dra- grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. Now different times people would make this Nazarite vow for a period of time. This is not the case with Samson. Samson is supposed to do it before he's born all the way till he dies. All the days he separated, verse number six, himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother or for his sister when they die. Be, because the consecration of God is upon his head. All the days of the separation, he is holy unto the Lord. And so we, we see here in verses one through eight, we see there's at least nine times that it talks about separation. What's the point is you, you have promises you have promises. He had promises. But he, the, the point was he was supposed to be separated unto the Lord. There's supposed to be a consecration. And there are certain things that as a Nazarite would show, hey, his hair would be long. It's, what is that showing? It's, it's a Nazarite vow. He wasn't supposed to drink anything of the vine. But not just drink. He wasn't supposed to eat of it. He wasn't even supposed to be around it or even, in a sense, be near it. Um, nothing to do with it. And then you see not touching dead animals or dead bodies. All those things were just saying, I have separated myself from these things so I can worship the Lord. Let's go back now to the book of Judges chapter number 13. So I I want you to get this and understand here that God's desire and the promises are connected to separation, to doing the things that God wants us to do. Now it's not specifically saying that you cannot touch a dead dead person or dead animal here. You didn't take the Nazarite to hell. (coughs) And and those, those stipulations there, that's not for us today. Because we have not taken a Nazarite vow. But there is plenty of things that we're supposed to be separated from. We're supposed to be separate from this world, right? We're supposed to be separated unto God. I think this is the key when it comes to separation. We're supposed to be separated unto the Lord. Sometimes people say, here's my separation. I don't do this, 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 and this. And they wear it like a badge. And I understand, there's, but the reality is we're supposed to be separated unto God. And when we're separated unto God, there's, there are things that we're not going to want to do. But it's not the things I don't do, but it's the one that I'm separated unto. I, I'm not going to watch that because I'm separated unto God. I'm not going to partake of that because I'm separated unto God. And people start saying, well, how, how, what am I allowed to drink what I'm not allowed to drink? Uh, what am I allowed to wear what I'm not allowed to wear? What am I allowed to listen to or watch? And you get all these different things. Become holy. Love the Lord of all your heart, all your mind. Your soul. Let him be the thing that thrills your life. And as, it, as he's the one that thrills your life, like we heard the singing earlier, he, what thrills my soul is Jesus. And let him be the number one infatuation of your life. And these other things, they're not going to matter to us anymore. You're not going to want to have anything to do with this because you're separated unto God. Now, as you separate unto God, you're going to separate from things in the world. Here, this is an instruction. This is something that's saying this is a vow. He is someone special. He's a man of promise. He's given to a mother that is has been barren. But also, he's, he's there to help to begin to deliver from He's beginning to deliver from the Philistines. The campfire is a desirable thing, but the fire that overruns the campsite is destructive. What does that mean? It means that there's different things we allow in our lives. And if we allow something just to overrun us with sin, you know what's going to happen? It's going to destroy us. There is a light that's important. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine hearts. Samson's life was to be a, a life of great promise. This would be fully realized only as it was a life of obedience and submission, separated from which that would destroy him. Think about that. Here's a life, great potential. Samson, here's a life, how how it's going to be provided. You don't do this, you don't do this, you don't do this as a sanctifying himself to the Lord. He had such great potential. He got done so many great things for God. 
but only when there's obedience and only when there's submission. So we look into the perfect law of liberty and we look at this and say, okay, do I have promises? Yes, we all have promises. He's promises he's never going to leave us. No, never alone. He's, he's never going to leave us. He's promised us that he will enable us to do exactly what he wants to do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Promise after promise after to promise. But why are we not fulfilling that? It's because sometimes that, that promises cannot fully be realized until there's a life of obedience and submission. Second thing I want you to think about, once again, we're going to have to move quickly. Not only a man of promise, but he was a man of power. Look what it says in verses 24 and 25. Verses 24 and 25. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. You know what the word Samson means? Sunshine. Uh, you know, the word Samson, either sun or sunshine. You know, you think, hey, come here, sunshine. You think of some cute little girl or something like that. Can you imagine big, strong Samson? Now, this question was, really Samson built like the Incredible Hulk? Or was he just a normal guy that the Spirit of the Lord came upon? I don't really know. But still, I wouldn't want somebody to call me sunshine. And that, but that's the, the, the sun. It's the light that he was supposed to bring to the nation of Israel. And so there, he, he's there. And he's, his name is called Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move and move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Ashtol. So here, here's a couple of things. It said that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Also, it says that the Lord blessed him. Now, most of us would know all some of the cool stories that he did. Think about it. He killed a lion with his bare hands. He slew 30 Philistines with no weapons. He caught 300 foxes, tied torches to, to their tails. He repeatedly broke attempts for people to bind them, slew a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey, broke away and carried off the gates of a city of Gaza, destroyed a great Philistine amphitheater. You know, we, we don't know all the great feats that Samson had done in his life. They, they, we don't know how many incredible acts of strength they did. These are just the ones that are recorded there. But he was definitely a man of power. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Samson, at the end of his life, tells Delilah, the power is in my hair. The power wasn't in his hair. The power, and some people say, well, because he got his hair cut. No. You think about it. He, he broke, didn't he break the other Nazarite vows? I mean, he broke the Nazarite vow by touching the dead, the dead lion car carcass, right? When he went down and touched the honey. That didn't, that didn't cause him to lose his strength. And you think about, it, did he touch the, the vines and things like that? He did. He had done those things. He had broken those things. It was like the last thing was his hair. He was presuming. He was a presumptuous man. And that's what we're going to get to in a minute. We become presumptuous as thinking that it's my hair. It's my hair. It wasn't his hair. It was the spirit of God. And sometimes we turn around and we start saying, oh, it's, it's because of this that God works. And it's because of this that God works. It's because this happened. No, it's what God does through us. And he's a man of power, but he's a man of power because of the spirit that was working him. There's no question that this man had seen firsthand the power of God in his life. The commentator wrote this, and I thought it was interesting. God never allows the enemy to gain power over us unless it is a result of our own failure. He never allows us to be brought under the power of evil unless there has been a departing from himself. The weakest, the most ignorant believer will be kept from the wiles and the power of the enemy so long as the heart is true and loyal to Christ. Think about that. We, we, the devil has no control over us. It is when we give in ourselves to a temptation, even the most ignorant will be kept from the wiles and power of the enemy so long as the heart is true and loyal to Christ. What comfort is that the weakest and most untutored saint, the youngest child of God, is perfectly safe from all this, so long as there is simplicity of communion with the Father and His Son, with His Son, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, many have seen the power of God work in their lives. But we have surrendered that power. We have given that power away. Yes, God's worked in the past. We've seen God move in the past, but we have stopped being separated. We have stopped believing the promises of God. And we have allowed ourselves to be overtaken by a temptation. You're going to see here just in a few minutes where those temptations came from. But that's what happens with Samson. The devil didn't have any rain, rule and reign under him until he was willing to allow himself to be taken in by the sin. Spirit of the Lord came upon him. It says that he was blessed. 
Next thing I want you to think about, he was a man of pleasure. Man of pleasure. Now, some people would say, well, when you think about Samson, what do you think about? First thing that many times comes to people's mind is Delilah. Now, sometimes strong, hair. But Samson's known for his pleasure, his love of women. You're like, well, isn't that better than love of men? Of course it is. But at the same time, he, it wasn't a godly pleasure. Look what it says in Judges chapter 14. It says, And Samson went down to Timoth and saw a woman in Timoth at the daughters of the daughters of the Philistines. It came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timoth of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of the, thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And salvation said unto his, unto his father, Get her for me. Now look at this last phrase. For she pleaseth me. Now let's, I mean, if, if it pleaseth me well. If you mark things in your Bible, that's a good spot to mark. This is what he is living for. This is what his desires. This is what makes me happy. Now the consecration, the power of the Lord, he's, he's seen the power of God on his heart. He's seen the power of God in his life. The Lord had blessed him, but he says, this is what makes me happy. And where he looks gets him in trouble. It talks about here how he saw this woman. Where is he at? He, if you notice, he's in a place where he shouldn't be. And because he's in a place that he shouldn't be, he sees something he should not see. Talk about how he gazed upon him means that he studies her intent. Samson is now directed by his lust of his eyes. He watches her. He wants her. He saw what was forbidden, but changed his convictions to accommodate his passions. He knew that he was not supposed to have that, but instead he changes his convictions and say, instead of saying it's wrong to marry a Philistine woman, instead, now I'm going to change my convictions so I can have what I want. We sell the power of God and the promise of God and the potential of God away when we see something and where sometimes we're around places where we shouldn't be and we go places we should not be at and we experience things we're not supposed to experience and we sit there with our eyes. You go back and you look at the stories here. You see this woman in Timoth, he looked at her, he wanted her. There's later on in chapter 16, verse number one, it talks about how he saw a harlot and went un, and unto her. It talks about another spot where he, he saw another woman and wanted her and the same thing with Delilah over and over in places where he should not be in places he should not be looking he sees things he should not have and we sell our potential short because of the fact we go and experience things we should not be a part of and instead we look at something and say that's what I want it pleases me well yeah where, where do you meet the lion at it was in the vineyards where is Delilah from in that city area? It's, it's known for being the word vineyard. He, he didn't even have any business being in the vineyards. That's, that's an area that he wasn't even supposed to be a part of. He wasn't supposed to drink of. He wasn't supposed to eat. Why was he there? You know, he's in places where he shouldn't be. And Christian, this happens. We, we change our conviction because we become passionate about something. There's things that we used to be passionate about. I'm never going to, I'm not going to, I'm never going to miss a church service. But then our convictions change when we become passionate about something else. We can become passionate about our family so much that we will and start skip church. We can become passionate about a hobby or a TV show to where we skip church. I tell you, tell you the story about 1995. I stayed home to watch the Steelers play Super Bowl and they lost because of the fact that I stayed home to watch them play the Super Bowl. It's because my convictions were changed because I was passionate about something and sports is something that people get passionate about and they're willing to change their convictions because they have a new passion. Their passion is no longer God. It's another person. It's another relationship. It's money. They have changed who they are because of the fact that they've seen something that God has never intended for them and because it was forbidden, he had to change his conviction just to accommodate his passions. Did God change his mind? He didn't. Now, sometimes I know we learn and we grow and we understand and as we make convictions in our heart and life, there are sometimes things that we change on a little bit because of the fact that we learn and grow in the Bible. But there is many things that we'll turn around and say, I used to not doing that. Something changed. God didn't change. His word didn't change. Our passions changed. And because our convictions didn't line up with our passions, you know what happens? We want to change. What happens then? We sell 
our future short. We sell our potential short. He, he's here and he, he's speaking to his father and his father, his mother, and he says, she pleaseth me well. The father stands up and says, isn't there a woman in all of Israel? Or is there not at least one that you can marry? And he's like, this is the one I want. How many times have we had that conversation? You say, hey, isn't there something that God, he said, is there not something in God's plan that would overweigh this? He, there is, this man is trying to be the authority in his life and be careful with, with not listening to spiritual authorities. And that's, sometimes people do it. They, they don't want to listen to their authority. So you know what happens? They change their conviction because their passion isn't. Yeah, I'm supposed to obey my parents until my parents get it wrong. I'm supposed to uh, heed the advice of the pastor until we don't want to talk to the pastor anymore. And there are different things and different people God has put in their lives. And they go like, nope, 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 that's no. Nope. My conviction is changed because my passion's changed. We should see what our passion is. And that's what happens with Samson. He was a man full of promise. He was a man full of potential. He was a man full of power. But he let his pleasure overrule him. When Samson went to Gaza, he saw a heart. Look what it said in chapter 16. And it says it right there in chapter 16, verse number 1. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went unto her. You know, what is that? It's complete immorality. He's going into a woman who sold her body. I mean, this is supposed to be the judge of Israel. This is supposed to be a Nazarite. Oh, I'm not going to do that, but I'm willing to go, go into a prostitute. I mean, there is what happens. His passion was, his eyes were somewhere. He saw something he shouldn't. And he began to be full of that lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And he had to have it. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging thing because our eyes, we need to keep them. We need to keep them to where we're not looking at the wrong things. He goes where he shouldn't go. He looks at what he shouldn't look at. We should be very careful what we look at. It says 77% of Christian men or 60% of Christian women have admitted they struggle with lust. 50% of Christian men and 20% of Christian women struggle with pornography. Now, these are the ones that say they're willing to admit to it. Can you imagine how many don't? 60% of Christian men and 40% of Christian women have sexual sin in their life in the last year. It talks about how the great, according to an internet filter review, the largest consumers of internet pornography are 12 to 17 year olds. 12 to 17 year olds, you said, that can't be true. I know young people in our church here, Faith Baptist Church, not currently right now, when I was a youth pastor years ago, who had problems with pornography. Now, I'm not going to tell you who, but obviously they struggled with it. It's something that was there and available for them. That's why we tell you be careful with phones, be careful with filters. And, and you're like, ah, I trust my child. Their, their parents trust their child too, and they were shocked when they saw it. And when they commit immorality and things like that. And that, you know, it's even in other churches all around, but it's not just young people, it's adults. They struggle with these things. Why is that? Because their passions have changed. They've seen things that they shouldn't see because they've gone to places they shouldn't go. Their passions have changed. So they have to change their convictions in order to be able to take and take part as passion. I have to have what I want. So if it means I have to walk over somebody else, or if I had to forget somebody else, or I had to be cruel to somebody else, or I had to, uh, you know, it's what's in our hearts and what's in our minds. Samson struggles. He never reaches his full potential because he was a man of pleasure. Hebrews eleven thirty two tells us Samson was a man of faith, but he definitely wasn't a faithful man. He wasn't faithful to the teaching of his parents. He wasn't faithful to his Nazarite vows, to his Lord, to the people of Israel and the laws of God. He was a man faithful to himself, pleasing of his own lust. He was faithful to do that which pleased him. And we must come to the spot and realize, I don't want to do those things that please me. I want to do those things that please God means that sometimes we have to change our convictions. And it's hard, it's tough because of the fact that we want people to love us. We want people to, we want people to understand us. So we want people to understand our passions and why we had to change our convictions. Why I can grow farther and farther away from God. Why I do not have to deal with relationships. Why I don't have to do things that clearly in the scriptures. It's because my passions change. We, we want to put God in it, but we're not passionate about it anymore. And what we're doing is we're selling that potential that right down the, right down the river, that power that God has. Remember, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. The fourth thing I want you to think about is he was a man of presumption. Presumption. 
There you go. There it is. A man of presumption. Or he was presumptuous. Samson's fall began with little presumptions. He really didn't think there was going to be anything wrong to walking in the vineyards. This is a dangerous place for a place that he's not supposed to do anything with grapes, but he's in a vineyard. God, he, I had one commentator I was reading, and he says, God even sent Samson a great warning when he was in that vineyard. He sent him that lion that he tore apart. I, I never really thought about that. God sends him, you know, he's in a spot where he really doesn't need to be at. He doesn't need to be looking at it because, you know, that's how the devil tempts us many times. God sends a lion there to try to show him, hey, this is a dangerous place to be. And of course, Samson, he, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon and tears it away. But it's something he doesn't learn from that. Where later on, he goes back to the vineyard. What happens? He sees the lions dead there. And what's there? The honey and the bees. You know, over and over, Satan is a roaring lion. He's looking to see whom he can devour. Samson didn't even mention this to his parents. Why wouldn't he mention it to his parents? Because his parents probably would have said, hey, you don't need to be in the vineyards. Why do we keep things from other people? It's because, hey, somebody might speak up and speak truth to you and say, hey, that's really not something you should be a part of. Well, it's because of the fact that our convictions have changed to meet our passions, but God's convictions hasn't changed. Are we keeping a secret spot? Is there something that we don't want others to know? Presumption is expecting the blessing and protection of God while continue to violate his commands. Let me read that again. It's not a quote from me, but it's really good. Presumption, presumption, maybe I'll get it right. Presumption is expecting the blessing and protection of God while continuing to violate his commands. Think about that. I want God's blessing, but I feel like I can continue to violate his commands. It doesn't match up. But that's, this is what Samson, Samson wants. Presumption is like praying that God would keep me from walking into the wall while continue to walking towards it. God, would you please help me not hit that wall? Would you please help me not hit that wall and keep on walking right into it? It's, I'm presuming upon God. I want God's blessings, but I don't want the blesser. Samson would assume that he could continue to enjoy the blessing of God while continuing to violate the principles that provide it for it. He felt like he could touch the dead carcass. He felt like he could partake of the, the vine and still have God's blessings. Is that true? Like I said, let's look in the mirror. Let's look at it, the perfect law of liberty individually. Am I continuing in something but still expect God's blessings? We're not going to get God's potential that way. As a church, am I continuing and not doing our part in some way, filling the Great Commission, faithfulness, relationships, and, you know, pride, all those things, but I still expect God to bless. I, I, I don't like to hear it because when I look in the perfect law of liberty, I'm thinking, you know what, that's a life that God can't bless. When I see something, I need to get rid of it. And remember, the blessings, yes, they are physical blessings that we all, the world even talks about. Yeah, we're so blessed because we have this, this, and this. And there's the spiritual blessings that a, that a believer understands. But there's also that blessed life that God can bless. And that's what Samson continues on living like this and just expects it's going to continue on and continue on and continue on. God's never going to punish. I'm going to keep on knocking down the Philistines as they get up. I'm going to knock them down again. Gonna, I can keep on living in sin. I can keep on looking at these women. I can keep on having immoral relationships. I can keep on hiding things from my parents. And I expect God to bless. And so often in our lives, we, fill, we sell our potential short because of the fact that I can keep on being what I want. I can change my convictions because my passions have changed. I can live whatever I want and still expect the blessing of God like he used to bless me when I lived for him completely. Then we continue on. We think we have the power. To, Samson assumed that he can continue and enjoy the blessing while continue to violate the principles that provide, God provided for him. We think we can have power to proclaim the gospel, but not do the work of the ministry. We think we can have the power to proclaim the gospel, but live wickedly in our private lives. We think we can raise godly children, but our hearts are far from God. When is the point of no return? When do you think, when do we stop thinking we can handle it? Samson's sin was presumptuous and is seen repeatedly. What, what did he do? He considered a Philistine for a spouse. What happens? It's, she's given unto another woman. 
met another man. He walks among the vineyards over and over. He took the honey from the carcass of the slain lion. He wasn't supposed to touch anyone. If anything, he even included his parents in that sin. He made a riddle or a joke for the Philistines out of his own sin. He went into a harlot in Gaza. He fell in love with Delilah. You know, over and over, we see him not learning from his mistakes. And verse number four, it says, And it came to pass afterward, chapter 16, that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Once again, that word Sorek means choice vines. He cannot stay out of it. He can't stay away from those vines. It's amazing. You go and you study. and We're not going to take the time to look at it. He never learned. He, never, he kept on presuming upon God. You think about it. Remember the first time when he was getting married, he married that woman and he, he, he made that joke or that riddle. And he, he said to the men, hey, you pay me this. If you can't figure it out, I'll pay you if you figure it out. And they went and threatened his future bride or his wife. And what does she do? She goes to Samson and she leans on him and keeps on asking it, asking it, asking for the answer to the riddle. And he gives it and he ends up getting burned in a sense. He, he loses out. So what happens with Delilah? Delilah keeps on asking and asking and asking, what's the secret to shrink? 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 He didn't learn the first time. He shouldn't have been around those people that didn't have any interest in him, that had interest in... He didn't learn one of Satan's most effective plans is to make himself appear utterly insignificant so that he, he will think little of him or a potential consequence of their actions. He wants us to remove himself from our minds. He, the, devil doesn't want to th the devil doesn't want you to think that, hey, I'm behind this. I'm presenting this for you. This woman you saw wasn't love. It was the devil presenting that. But he doesn't see that. This, this woman pleases me well. If he would have looked past the sin, if he would have looked past the passion, if he would have saw the conviction and said, you know what? That's the devil trying to get me off of God's path. That's the devil trying to get me off of what he wants for me. I don't need to change my conviction. I need to change my passion to where I love the Lord. Psalms chapter 19, verses 13 and 14 puts it this way. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. If Samson would not have been kept on with the little sins, going down to Philistines and just checking out the lay of the land, if Samson wouldn't have been walking through the vineyards, if he wouldn't just kept on presuming upon God, hey, if I do this little bit of sin, hey, if I grab this honey, it's sitting there, I'm being a good steward. If I just go over there and check out the, what, what their Philistine land is, maybe he's going to say I'm checking out for military purposes where he's really checking out in moral women. You know, he, he keeps on presuming and presuming and presuming upon God. And what happens? He does the greater sin. And so often we will stay inside a small sin and think this is not a big deal. God doesn't care. Does God? And then we continue on and the sin gets bigger. And then we, we keep on presuming, a presuming and presuming upon God and it gets bigger to the point that they're there and he's in bondage and he's walking around doing an animal's job and he has lost his potential. Christian, many times we have sold that potential for a pot of soup like, like the Esau did. Sold his birthright away for just a pot of soup. Samson found that every pleasure or lust of his flesh desire was given to him. He never lived a life of satisfaction. He continued on, this pleases me well. I'm going to do what pleases me well. I'm going to do what pleases me well. I'm going to do. And it was a life that there was never truly satisfied. The Bible says, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot attain. Ye fight in war, ye have not because ye ask not. Samson was a man of pain also. What do you mean a man of pain? You're talking about when he plucked out his eyes. I don't think he was ever really truly satisfied. He had the Spirit of the Lord come upon him numerous times. He was a, he was a man of promise who was, could have delivered his nation. But he chose to do things that made him happy. Look what it says in chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. And she said the Philistines be upon thee. This is Delilah who's tricked him and he, he shaved off his hair. Samson, and he woke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And look at it in this phrase. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. If you're, if you're used to marking things in your Bible, that's a great line. 
he didn't even know that God was no longer with him. How many, how many believers' lives is that true? And I know what you're going to say. He's promised he's never going to leave me or forsake. I understand that. I'm talking about the power of God's not there. How many churches have lived and done and gone through church and they've played church so long that their convictions have changed, their passions have changed. What church is supposed to be about is no longer what it's about. And the power of God is no longer on the church. And they don't even see it. They don't even know it. They don't even understand it. Let that never be said about us. Let it never be said that because of our presumptuous sins, oh, it's okay if I keep on doing this. It's okay if we keep on doing this. It's okay if we're not part of the Great Commission. It's okay if we're not a praying church. It's, it's okay if we don't do this. It's, these are just little, and we keep on presuming God's going to bless, and God's going to bless, and God's going to bless. And then we don't even realize the Spirit of God is no longer with us. God help us to seek God's power. And say, I'm not going to presume upon God. I want to live a holy life so God can bless my life. You know how many times the Bible talks about that Samson called upon the Lord? Twice. The one time when he was moaning that he was getting ready to die because he had just killed the thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. And he, he's, it's a very prideful statement, but he's like, I'm getting ready to perish here. And, and God provides that not just a drink of water, but a well of water. And then at the end of his life, what does he do? He asks the Lord to remember him as he's getting ready to push the, the pillars apart. Two times. He says, and now once again, he said, Pastor, maybe he just recorded. I get that. But many times, you know what? We presume more than anything in our, in our, in our lives. So we become presumptuous about the sin of not praying. I'm guilty. God knows my problems. God knows my needs. I don't really need to talk to him. And we stop praying. We lose that connection. And that's the key that unlocks the doors of potential. It's when we learn how to pray. We, we get figure, I don't have to. We're presuming upon God when he tells us to continually be praying. Pray without ceasing. So he was a man full of potential. Look at, look at one of Samson's prayers there. And let's see here. This is chapter 16, look at what it says, verse number 30. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself and all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord's. He prays unto God in verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord, God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. How much potential could have Samson had? It, it even says at the end of verse number 30, so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. When he prays to God, now get this and we'll close. When he prays to God, he does more in a moment than he did in the 40 years he was acting judge. Think about that. When he's praying to God and he's seeking God's help, he can accomplish more than he did in the rest of his life combined. Wow. The sin of presuming that I don't need to pray. We're selling our potential short when we do that. We see Samson. <laughs> he was a man of promise. He was a man of potential. It was a man over and over. Obviously, he was a man of power, but he was a man of pleasure. It pleases me well. This is what I want. I have to have what I want. This is what makes me happy. I change my passion means I have to change my convictions to get what I want because no longer does it line up with God. No longer is he the thrill. It means that I become a man also of presumption. Presumption. Then a man of pain. So what does this have to do with us coming off revival? I don't know about you, but when I sit and listen to revival services over and over, God speaks to my heart. I see the potential that God has for my life. We see the potential God has for our church. And we lose it sometimes. Where do we lose it at? It's because we don't fix those presumptuous sins. 
if we would begin to say, I want to be holy because I want to please the Lord. I'm not going to seek those things that pleases me well. It pleases me well. I'm more important. I need to get my way. Instead, in a humble heart, God, I want to do things your way. Tonight, you are chock full of potential. He said, Pastor, I'm old. I don't feel it. With God, you can do all things. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose for your heart. He's got a purpose for your life. Do not, do not say, I can't do anything. Instead, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Full potential. I believe each of us are. More importantly, I'd like for us to look and see as a church. Full potential. Is there something that's holding us back? It's something that's, ask the Lord, is it something in me that's holding us back? Because as we start seeking his glory and his honor, he'll show those things that he wants us to work on too. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the story.